Greetings, ladies and mantle gents, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from Outer of space. space. And as always, I hope that you enjoy. Story number one, Living Conditions, written by Radius 55. And so he asked me if I knew who his matriarch was. No. Yes, and I thought they only said that in hollows. Senior researcher Galel laughed. He and his colleague, researcher Malak, were walking the primary teaching center and catching up. Galel had not had anywhere near as much free time since his last promotion, so he savored times like this one. Well, what did you do with him? Matriarch well, R does have quite the temper. Oh, I know, the researcher replied, facial tendrils flexing in a pattern of amusement. That's why I told him that I'd be messaging her the next time I felt he wasn't obliging himself. That, and she told me just last cycle that I shouldn't accept any laziness from her spawn. Malak clapped his prime hands together in amusement at the thought of the fearsome old matriarch disappointed in one of her descendants. Stan corrected, you do have a more arrogant understudy than I do. The worst of mine would never in a thousand epochs try that one. Well, uh, Gadeel said, still with an expression of mild amusement. They're not all that bad. I might even take a few as assistants during the upcoming term. Once I beat some of the Sidian notions out of their heads, of course. Like what? His companion asked, quickening his steps slightly. They were finally in sight of their destination, and the twin primaries above them were quite warm. He was looking forward to getting into a climate control of the teaching center. Well, he began, I had one come to me just the other day asking all of these questions about evolution of civilization. I'd given the group the usual midterm project of computational cosmology. You know, develop the parameters for a simulation that would lead to the maximum rate of technological development. The doors ahead of them slid open and a blast of gloriously cool air. Continuing into the Institute while high-order computing, Galeo continued to talk. Oh, one of my brightest students turned in two assignments. First was her normal, excellent work. Rough guess would be just under three quarters of a million revolutions for a tribal existence to space flight. That is impressive, Malak said. And the other? I honestly thought it was garbage, he replied. I can't imagine any sentient creature evolving on it, much less achieving technological mastery. But she was quite adamant her own limited simulation showed the species would reach it in just 30,000 revolutions. This belief showed on Malik's speeches. His own field of high-energy particle interactions wasn't related to Galeel's, but he knew enough to understand how preposterous that claim was. After all, it had taken his own ancestors nearly 15 times that long to go from small tribes to the stars. I assume, he said slowly, she proposed something other than dropping them on a world of functional precursor artifacts. Oh no, that's not all. In fact, if you have a seg, I'll show you. He said as they passed a group of researchers gathered around a flashing terminal. Show me, Malak asked. Yes, it was the only way I could get her to drop it. I had some spare cycles in one of my sim systems anyway, so I let her set the program up to run overnight. You still haven't told me what was so odd about her parameters, Malak reminded him. Oh, those, uh, well, <laughs> she put them on a death world, uh, a, a category 12. N no. Yes, uh, I know. Her own sim must have had a bug in it. Maybe the environmental skating was flipped or intellect level artificially magnified or something. But she always had been a good student, and so I figured I'd humor her. Good learning experience, you know. They both flicked their facial tendrils at that. Students always hated good learning experiences at the time that they received them. Ah, oh, and here we are, Blail said, as they arrived at the lab. The lock read his identity and opened, revealing a dark room filled with a high-end quantum computing system and the interface to run them. He walked to one of them and sat down in front. A few moments later, he grunted in satisfaction. Take a look, he said moving aside to let Malak see. On the screen, Malak could see the line after line of data. Here and there, pieces jumped out to him. Planet Category 12, Species a Humanoid, Initial Technological Level, Stone Age, Duration 30,000 Revolutions. Then, there, at the bottom, were the important fields. Current Population, Zero. Simulation, Complete. I knew it, Galeo was saying with smug satisfaction. There must have been a bug in her code. That's the only explanation. 
Malak tuned the babble out as he continued to look over the logs. There was only a brief summary on the current page, about one data point per thousand revolutions. Still, it was interesting reading. The species appeared to have survived for quite some time, longer than he would have expected out of death world. In fact, they had been present in fairly large numbers just before the final data had been collected. Not much technology to speak of, but still there. And with the sort of environment they had been facing, that was saying something. Malak's attention was drawn back to Galil as he moved over to another system. Now, if you want to see something really interesting, here's the sim I started last week. So far, it's been tracking our own homeworld's evolution with less than half a percent deviation. Really? Malak asked. That's quite something. He leaned over to look at the screen, only to see it flashing oddly. Um, is this supposed to be happening? No, I really hope nothing's been corrupted. I'd hate to start it all over again, he grumbled. I'm going to go get tech support. Moving to the next terminal, he tried to open a messaging program. Instead, the screen just showed the same odd flashing as its neighbor. Now, beginning to worry, Galeel hurried to check the rest of the systems. At each, the situation was the same. Screens blinking with odd alphanumeric sequences and not responding to any input. It has to be a virus, Galeel said disgustedly. Days and days of runs, ruined by some eggless pukul's fun. He reached for his personal communicator. The only thing left was to call security and... He froze, facial tendrils going instantly still in pure shock. Com unit not even out of his pocket. Strong Galeel? Malak asked, concerned. When his colleague didn't answer, he followed his gaze to the one terminal. The one the first looked upon entering the lab. It alone, out of all the other screens of the room, seemed unaffected by the electronic plate. Oh. There's something odd about it, Malak realized. The logs had been replaced by a few lines of text that read... In that instant, he felt himself go as still as Galeel. There on the screen was an implausible message. You are finally here. Good, we are humanity, and we would like to discuss these living conditions. And if we refuse, Galeel said, tendrils twitching nervously. He wasn't even sure why he responded out loud, but it didn't seem to matter. The interface was wide for both sound and video, and a new line of text appeared. We would prefer to avoid any <laughs> unpleasantries, but uh, just so you are aware, your browser histories now belong to us. We hope that simplifies things. Story number two. Sword and Stone, written by Operation Technician. I've never seen anyone react to the memorial like that, said my guide. I closed my mouth. Why would they? The darkest age was centuries ago, and even then few knew what this nightmarish things looked like. Ancient, secret history. The grinding in my head refused to cease. I thought through the series of events that had ended up with me, here, in front of this thing. Go to college, join the exchange program, get driven to another solar system and planet, to an arguably prestigious university. Easy enough, given how hard us humans are to get a hold of. So far, so good. But why does this university have this thing in the middle of its central garden? Why wasn't it an advertised site around here? Might as well ask. Why wasn't this uh, memorial on the brochures? Should it be? The guide asked. It's ugly and boring compared to the other sculptures. Sure. Boring. Why not? Three identical, tall, asymmetrical pyramids arranged in a circle. Two hundred meters tall, without any details or engravings, painted grey. Their proportions, slopes, and strange broken forms were unmistakable to me. And only me. Great void of space. They put a plaza right in the center, between the pyramids. There are benches there, and people, right in the trajectory of fire. No author on the plaque, just the words, just in case... Every few years there's a motion to demolish it, but it never goes through in case we figure out who made it, or what it means. I snorted, now on the edge of hysteria. Demolish it. Demolish the other 200 meters of 5 kilometer tall Darkest Age battlecraft. Damage the 20 meter thick Jurasteel armor that had been so carefully painted over to hide its energy dissipating snow white properties. Scratch one of the machines that killed the gods. End of story.
The algorithm reckons you should be watching this video next, and I recommend that you should be always watching my video. So, click it click. With energy! And yes, clicking that does help the channel. Thank you very much. I would just quickly like to give thanks to our tier 5 members. Alicia Barkey, Pudicule, Meridian117, Cam Maxwell, Casper Arnholtz, Albarden Gusta, Savage Patch Papa, and Lord Azra 